During the construction of migration, when putting together the drivetrain, I was reminded of a fundamental aesthetic truth. Roller chain is really pretty. I should do more work with roller chain, I said to myself. In fact, I continued unnecessarily, I hereby vow to do just that. And this video, the one you are watching right now, is part of the fulfillment of that promise. It'll also serve to fulfill another promise I made several years ago to make a kinetic sculpture for my aunt, Carol Howell. She's an artist, and I grew up kind of surrounded by her work. She's one of the people who let me realize you could just make cool stuff and no one would stop you. So thank you, and sorry this took so long. I'm afraid this is one of the projects where I can't weave some complicated story about inspiration. I was thinking about roller chain, and the idea popped more or less fully formed into my head. What if you had a length of roller chain, draped over multiple sprockets, which turn to move the chain between them, forming long, elegant catenaries that flow back and forth over time? Hell, even the name presented itself immediately. I'd call it Tides. There is an almost Gigoresque, squiggly biological aspect to roller chain. Hard steel and geometric shapes, yes, but it's also glistening and supple. This seemed like an excellent showcase for that. Beyond just being pretty, roller chain would actually be ideal in this context. It can't slip. So as long as it starts in a known state, and you always rotate the sprockets by a known amount, then it's just some simple bookkeeping to track how much chain is where. Assume a basic microcontroller to do the arithmetic, and you could keep stuff moving back and forth indefinitely. The obvious choice for this was stepper motors. These are cheap, commodity motors that can be controlled to rotate by specific angular amounts. They are similar to a servo motor with some key differences. A servo has a sensor built into it that directly measures what angle it is at. Turn it off, unplug it, and manually twist the horn to a new position. As soon as it has power again, it will know what angle it is actually at. A feedback loop will actively try to maintain that angle, so you can push against it and it will push back. Even if you manage to overpower it briefly, it will still go back to the set angle. Usually, a servo has a limited range, so it can only rotate through a certain number of degrees before having to stop and reverse. These are great in, say, RC plane control surfaces. Or robot limbs. An elbow only has to move through 70-so degrees, but it does need to exert force to maintain its orientation. A stepper isn't limited like that. It can keep rotating in the same direction forever. But it also doesn't have the feedback loop. By itself, it never has any clue what angle it is at. But it can repeatedly and precisely rotate by some small amount, so its controller can just keep sending commands and keep track for it, as long as there isn't too much torque fighting against it. Enough torque can overcome the internal magnetic forces on the rotor, forcing it to rotate, and the controller has no way of knowing if and when that happens. So they're best used in contexts where the forces are known to be limited, but a large amount of rotation is needed, such as CNC tables or 3D printers. Another nice benefit is that, because they are used in so many 3D printers and CNC tables, is that there are lots of kits available which will provide the steppers, the control electronics, and even a microcontroller in one convenient package. The one I got off AliExpress came with A4988 drivers for up to four motors and a CNC shield with which to use them. Getting them running took a bit of work, because all the guides are written assuming you'll be using them for their intended purpose, being run from CNC software that is interpreting G-code. I had to set a couple jumpers on the board. These two, to let the fourth A channel control an independent stepper, instead of mirroring X, Y, or Z. And each driver needed all of these set to move the steppers at a 1 16th micro step of their default rotational step of 1.8 degrees. This put them at their maximum angular resolution of about 0.1 degrees per step, which was important for smoothing the motion at the lower speeds it would be operating at. Theoretically, I could have implemented the sculpture using a standard CNC model and just fed in G-code to achieve the motion that I wanted, but have you seen G-code? What a nightmare. So instead, I just wrote my own control code, which was really a lot easier than it sounds. A stepper is just waiting to be told to make a step and in what direction. This means setting one line high or low to tell it the direction and sending a pulse on another line to tell it to make a step. That's it. The driver electronics are just there to safely deal with the current needed to drive the motors without it frying out the microcontroller. This isn't to say that writing a real CNC controller is easy, but the real complexity when you start dealing with things like acceleration curves and 
the momentum of large machine tools and tool changes and feeds and speeds and whatnot. For my much simpler purposes, everything just worked. Except for how the Arduino clone that came with the kit kept rebooting itself randomly after five to ten minutes of operation. I spent days trying to solve that problem before finally thinking to swap in a real Arduino, at which point it magically went away. Caveat emptor. With that working, I took a piece of scrap aluminum and made a simple mounting plate for the four steppers. I ended up holding this in a cheap clamp vise, which was mounted on the corner casting I bought for the scale shipping container project. It was never very useful for that project, but sometimes it's really convenient to have big lumps of cast iron laying around. This let me set it up on my desk at home for code development. High enough that there was plenty of room for the chain to droop, but still within arm's reach. Remember, it always has to be reset to a known position between runs. In this case, that means removing any chain from between the motors, leaving it drooping down just slightly between each one. I broke the coding problem down into three realms. Design, command, and control. Design would set and then gradually update the long-term goal of how much chain should be between each motor. Command would compare this goal with the current state and determine which motors need to turn in which direction and at what speed in order to get to that goal. And finally, control would take the speed state and do the appropriate pulse width modulation to achieve the relative speeds as commanded. The real challenge with the code was purely one of aesthetics. How do I move the chain around in a smooth, organic manner? After playing around for a while, there were a few things in particular I knew I wanted it to be able to do. Move chain from one loop through one or more intermediate loops to another loop. I loved how this looked with the intermediate loops in motion but not changing in length. Move chain from one source to multiple destination loops. Move chain from multiple sources to a single destination. Move to and from multiple loops with the sprocket speeds all scaled so they all hit their target values at the same time. I spent a couple weeks on this trying out several different approaches. At one point, I thought I'd actually use my CS degrees and do it as a single hyper-elegant linear algebra problem. I got all excited to use LU decomposition for once and was inventing my own notation for writing out the equations and everything. And that was great and worked really well until I realized I'd only been testing on single-step problems, where a chain was only moving across a single motor in either direction. Anything more complicated than that, and it, well, stopped being a linear problem. Whoops. I ended up with a hackier but more flexible approach of first determining what direction each motor was turning by looking what needed chain and what needed to get rid of chain. Then the scaling of motor speed was worked out by stepping through each watershed and seeing how much was coming from each source and how much was going to each destination. These speeds were then normalized across all the motors and scaled down by the current speed factor. There were still some edge cases it had troubles with, but the system was robust enough to fail gracefully. This meant I could now control the steppers given the desired speeds, and I could generate speeds given a goal state. All that was left was generating the goal states. Like a lot of software problems, the requirements got fuzzier the further I moved away from the hardware. After all, it's software. It can do basically anything you can think of. That's what makes it so amazing and why it drives some people crazy. No constraints, except the ones you build in as an implicit assumptions into the basic structure of your code. And those are the hardest ones to reason about. And in this case, the requirements were about as vague as you could get. Make the chain move around in a way that looks pretty. I knew I wanted it to feel organic or like part of a natural process. The piece's name, Tides, really gave me the most guidance here. Make it feel like the tidal flow in a particularly complicated estuary like Puget Sound. It should feel like there is a pattern, but also that it would take a lot of very serious effort to figure out exactly what that pattern is. I always find that a lot more interesting than pure randomness. So I tried doing it the same way tide tables are made, by stacking sine waves. I mean, yes, everything can be made out of stacked sine waves if you try hard enough, thank you Fourier, but people were successfully predicting tides using mechanical sine wave stackers back in the 19th century. At their core, they're just a bunch of disks of different diameters, rotating eccentrically at different speeds, with cables running around them to sum up their heights. Sine wave stackers. Even with a specific approach in mind, though, there was still a mortal infinity of parameters to play with. How many sine waves? What wavelengths? With what phase offset between them? What magnitude? What propagation speed? 
Luckily, being an artist, I just had to find a combination that, you know, looked good. So I threw together some JavaScript to fiddle with these parameters and finally settled on this. The brown line is the summation of the other sine waves, and the red dots on it represent the sampling points for each catenary. And implemented on the real thing, it did seem to be doing more or less what I had in mind. Oh, and I finally switched to using VS Code instead of the default Arduino text editor, and boy howdy do I wish I had done that earlier. It's a bit of a pain to set up, but absolutely worth it. If I'm going to be addicted to modern IDE refactoring tools, which seems to have happened somehow, I should at least have access to them as widely as possible. However, a plate held in a vise with an Arduino dangling off the back is not a finished piece. This was going to need an enclosure. And again, popping fully formed into my head, I knew what it should be made out of. Concrete. I mean, I'm an industrial artist, right? I had been meaning to work with it as a medium anyway, and this seemed like a perfect opportunity. So I grabbed a 35 kilo bag and set to work experimenting. I was going to have to make a form for casting the concrete, but first, what was the form to be made out of? So I did a round of concrete test paddies on different plywoods which also served to let me start figuring out a repeatable process for mixing up small batches of concrete. In the end, I settled on a 10 to 1 mix to water ratio by mass, using this Pro Finish by Quitcrete crack resistant concrete mix. I decided the OSB texture, while it can be really cool on a larger scale, didn't work visually for something this small. I went with the press board, simply because I had some spare to work with, and it's quite cheap anyway. The general shape of the enclosure was pretty simple just a hollowed out brick with a place for the mounting plate to attach on the front. But even something as simple as this gets much more complicated when being cast. I was going to need to be able to remove the form after the concrete had cured without damaging the enclosure or the form itself because I was probably going to have to do this several times to get it right. The outer perimeter was pretty simple. Two sets of two boards hinged together. These pairs then screwed together around a base plate. Since press board is far too soft to be screwed into directly more than once, I used these threaded inserts. And that gave me an idea for the enclosure itself. See, I was going to have to attach the mounting plate somehow. I had been thinking about casting holes in the front of the enclosure through which the plate could be bolted. But casting narrow holes sounded hard, and getting them in the right position sounded even harder. I didn't think I could cast around a screw to leave a threaded hole. Even with a very chunky thread pitch, it would almost certainly crumble the first time it was used. But what about using threaded inserts instead? These are usually intended for use in woodworking, to add a robust threaded hole that will stand up to multiple uses. You drill a large hole for it, then screw it in so these thick threads on the outside can bite into the wood. I couldn't screw them into cured concrete, of course, but what about casting them in place? These screws pass through the base plate of the form, through the aluminum mounting plate, and had the inserts threaded on. This let them serve double duty by also holding the mounting in place for the casting. That just left the big cavity inside the enclosure. This needed a plug, or core, to use the metal casting terminology, to take up the volume and then be removed after casting was done. It would have to bolt to the mounting plate, keep it in place for the casting. Remember, lots of things are less dense than concrete and will float. The important thing here was that it needed draft on all its sides. If they were parallel, then even with a good mold release agent, the friction keeping it from popping out would be so high, I'd almost certainly damage it or the casting in the process of removing it. I decided to make it out of some of the leftover wrench shape from the Manhattan Project carrying case replica from a few years ago. Wrench shape is a synthetic material popular in the prop making community, kind of like artificial wood. Super consistent wood without any grain or creepy organic swelling as the humidity changes. Wood plus plus. It machines beautifully, taking massively deep and fast cuts in stride while still leaving behind a beautiful surface. It does make quite a mess though. It almost powders as it is cut, and the shavings pick up a static charge in the process and stick to everything. For the first casting, I waxed up all the surfaces of the mold to act as a release agent. I tried troweling the concrete into the undercut section, to make sure it got filled properly, but mostly that just made a big mess. The rest was just dropped in from the top and pushed around with a stirring stick to make sure it filled all the voids. Three days later, I opened it up. The sides came away beautifully. 
the core, mm, less so. Ah. But overall, I actually found the results really promising. There weren't any serious air bubble problems, and the details were all picked up quite nicely. At least as well as I wanted from this, anyway. Crudely industrial is kind of the look, right? I had high hopes for the second test, with a couple changes. I painted all the surfaces with whey oil this time, which is a thick lubricating oil made for the ways of machine tools. It's designed to not drip off, which seemed like a good feature in this context. It also smells really nice, up there with dicum and aluminum tapping compound for my most favorite shop smells. I also added loops of wire as I built up the layers of concrete to act as reinforcement. Since the first casting had ended up a bit short of the top of the form, I upped the total material going into it to 5 kilograms of mix and 500 grams of water. And this time, I let it sit for 5 whole days before touching it. The results on the second casting were more or less usable. I think it was the extra curing time more than the reinforcing wire, but whichever it was, this one didn't crumble at all as the core was removed. I did get some chip out as the mounting plate was removed, but honestly I could have lived with that. But I knew I wanted to make a third one anyway. The scope had creeped some while the concrete was curing. I decided the enclosure needed a name and date on it, and also a way to attach some rubber feet. This was going to live in my aunt's house after all, and I can't have it scratching up her tabletop or whatever. To add the name, I modeled a simple plate and blender, mirrored it, printed it out, and glued it onto one side of the forum. On the other side, I drilled four new holes, through which another four threaded inserts were screwed in place. It worked so well for the mounting plate, why not for the rubber feet? This way, they would be very well attached, and not just stuck in place with glue or something questionable like that. If the not inconsiderable mass of this thing shifts during transit, I don't want them popping off. And the third casting came out more or less perfect. The name debossing is a bit more aggressive than I had been imagining, but it's fine. It probably won't even be seen much once it's up on a shelf. And, as imagined, the rubber feet feel absolutely bomb-proof. I ended up doing a fourth casting to add yet more screw inserts on the back for the electronics mounting, but otherwise it was exactly the same. All that was left was mounting the electronics, with a 12-volt power supply feeding the Arduino and the steppers, and it was done. Plus plenty of Loctite for all the fasteners, of course. It's poor form to send a gift that is rattled into pieces by the time it arrives. I often cite Arthur Ganson as one of my major influences, and this is probably the most Ganson-y piece I've ever made, even though it does include programming. I think I'll stick to avoiding microcontrollers as much as possible, they're just too easy, but for something like this, I think the end justifies the means. I can vaguely imagine doing it purely electromechanically, but... Ugh. Sometimes you just want to make something that works, you know?